so I'm Lynn Alden, and I'm here with Eric Basmajan uh, of EPB uh, Macro Research, uh, and we're going to talk about a couple different things related to his strategy and about uh, the global macro environment at the current time. Uh, so, Eric, welcome to Real Vision. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I've been looking forward to this conversation, uh, you know, because we, we've had a lot of interactions in the past about, you know, some of the things happening on the economy. And so I figured, it's, you know, it's, it's great that we're able to talk about it. So why don't we start by uh, you giving, uh, you know, the viewers some idea of your background uh, and you, what your overall process is, uh, as, you know, as part of your research. Sure. So I'll, uh, I'll start with a quick background for those that, that are unfamiliar. I uh, studied economics at, at NYU. Um, while I was there, basically my last year, I worked at uh, Morgan Stanley full time on a wealth management team. Um, I then jumped straight to the buy side, uh, worked for a quant fund in Midtown. Uh, good experience, learned some programming, some statistics. Um, economics was always my passion. So I was still studying economics the whole time I was there, uh, basically reading everything that was available in terms of academic research on debt and the impacts there. Uh, I have a big focus on, on long-term trends. Um, that's obviously where I ran into the work of Lacey Hunt, who's been highly influential to my thinking. Um, I also studied quite heavily Jeffrey Moore, who used more of a leading indicator approach to the business cycle. So using some of those statistical uh, techniques that, that I was working with at the fund, I was creating some of my own composite indicators, You know, taking five or six or seven different uh, data points and combining them into one aggregate indicator. Um, so basically what I do, uh, was I was taking the, the long-term trends, which, you know, sometimes don't change for 20, 30, 40 years. And, um, you know, it could be valuable for some people to just ride that trend for a long time, but having experience on the buy side with performance that gets, you know, marked to market, it's just not realistic for most people to, to stay on such a long-term trend like that. So I tried to bridge that gap by staying focused on those long-term trends, but also using a leading indicator approach to pick up the uh, cyclicality within some of those longer-term trends. And um, I left the fund, started publishing my own work, and uh, that's kind of how EPB Macro Research got started. This is going to be the, the fifth year, and um, that's that's kind of the 30,000-foot overview of, of what I do. Um, my, my views now are that the, uh, the long-term trends, the the impacts of debt and other structural forces like demographics are pulling us towards weaker and weaker growth. Uh, but at the same time, the leading indicators are, are pointing higher, which gives us uh, some short-term momentum to the upside. And uh, that can make allocating a little bit trickier than when the, uh, when the trends are aligned. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss uh, those two things, but that's sort of where I shake out on the, the long-term and short-term. Yeah, perfect. I think that you know that kind of sets the stage to go in a couple of different directions. I guess to start with, uh, it, you know, if we if we you know focus on some of those leading indicators, uh, can you give the people uh, you know a sense of what sort of indicators you focus on, uh, and what are they kind of telling you uh, about the next say six months or so, or what is the timeline you're looking at when you, when you when you say shorter term? Sure. So for me, short term is exactly what you said. So six months, six to twelve months is sort of the range that I'm talking about with the short term. Anything shorter than that is, is a little bit too noisy for me. Uh, so most of the leading indicators that I'm focused on are very heavily centered in the manufacturing sector. Uh, that's the, the most volatile uh, sector, much more than the uh, services economy. And I believe a lot of people um, you know, uh, overlook the manufacturing sector, especially in the United States, because they say you know, it's such a small percentage of the economy, it doesn't really matter. But the volatility of the manufacturing sector is so much greater. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you one dollar. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Uh, overlook the manufacturing sector, especially in the United States, because they say you know it's such a small percentage of the economy; it doesn't really matter. But the volatility of the manufacturing sector is so much greater than the services sector that it actually still drives the ebbs and flows of, of GDP. And 
my big process is following the rate of change or the direction of growth in uh, growth and inflation. So those shorter term manufacturing sectors pick up uh, different uh, types of production backlogs or, or new orders to inventory, uh, things like that. And this uh, situation with COVID sort of caused a lot of these indicators to go haywire. And, and what I mean by that is um, when the lockdown happened, uh, we saw consumption stop for a brief period of time. But then what we saw was consumption shift very dramatically towards things that could be consumed at home, lots of durable goods. And that caught basically every supplier totally off guard. And what we saw was uh, inventories get depleted to basically the lowest level we've ever seen as a percentage of GDP. And then as a result, all of the suppliers had to restock all of that inventory. And we started to see a classic economic sequence come through all the leading indicators where commodity prices, specifically lesser traded ones, not really uh, like copper or oil, but some of the industrial metals really start to pick up. New order to inventory ratios started to explode. And we sort of uh, began this manufacturing restocking rebound that's happening globally. And it's causing uh, a strong upturn in both the rate of growth and inflation, which is a little confusing to people because they look at you know maybe the labor market that's still really impaired or uh, just the the partial shutdowns in, in some parts and they could say how's the economy improving but that manufacturing process can be so strong and and that's what we're seeing now and it's still ongoing and for the next couple of months I think that the bias for both growth and inflation are still going to be higher and that's counter to my long-term view which which makes the allocation process slightly more difficult. Uh, you know, avoiding or, or underweighting things like long-term treasuries that may benefit from some of the long-term trends. Um, so those are kind of the indicators that I that I look at, mostly manufacturing-based. And right now, they're still off of the upside. Yeah. So if you focus on um, uh, those indicators uh, and then how they pertain to market prices, uh, what what sort of correlations or causations have you found? Uh, so say you're accurate about all these, you know, the, the growth and the inflation, how do you translate right. that into an, an investment portfolio and, and how do you kind of monitor risk or monitor if those trades are working out? Sure. So I start with a balance framework and this can be applied to, to any sort of balance framework. I, I gravitate to, to the all weather framework combination of long-term bonds, intermediate term bonds, stocks, gold, and commodities. And that's sort of where I approach every situation. I come to the table with a balance framework. Then I, I tilt uh, in a direction that's most aligned with the long-term trend. So I'm always going to have a bias towards the treasury allocation or the growth slowing allocation, which tends to favor treasuries over things like commodities. Um, but then I also am cognizant of the short-term trends. So when the short-term trends are pointing higher, you'd want to be doing uh, the opposite, basically. You'd want to be overweight or starting to overweight commodities, risk assets, things that perform well when growth is uh, is increasing. And, and those are the correlations that, that I find. So when growth is increasing, specifically nominal growth, uh, equities perform basically the best out of, out of those uh, all those assets, commodities the second best. And within the equity sector, you wanna be tilted more towards the cyclical equities, the small caps, the industrials, things that benefit from that manufacturing upturn. So I come to the table with a balanced framework, I have a long-term bias to, to my long-term views. Then I take the shorter-term indicators and I sort of tilt or, or uh, overlay that on top. And, and right now with the uh, indicators pointing higher, um, tilted more heavily towards commodities than I normally would be. Uh, and my stock allocation has small caps where it's typically more large cap defensive as a as a balanced framework. And how are you seeing uh, banks uh, fitting into that? Because you know I've, I saw some interesting charts the other day showing that you know banks and energy have been you know just the, the key underperformers uh, for a while now. So a lot of people focus, for example, on growth versus value, uh, but you know value right. can be further separated into defensive value versus cyclical value. And it's really been in that cyclical value where there's been a lot of underperformance. Uh, and there, you right. know, there's there's some kind of a recent rebound there. We you see them kind of uh, upticking, especially ever since we got some of the vaccine announcements a few months ago. Right. So how do you see the energy and uh, financial sectors kind of playing out over you know the next six months or maybe longer term? So I'm a little bit more cautious on the banks. I mean, I've I've had a long-term short position on uh, in specifically the regional banks since 2018, uh, which has worked out quite well. But 
uh, I've, I've paired that back to basically the smallest allocation I could have on the short side because these cyclical trends, uh, when there's an upturn, the bias for long-term interest rates is, is higher. So the bias for the yield curve is steeper. That, that's going to tend to benefit the banks. Um, but I'm cautious on the banks because they're fighting such a, a secular trend of rock bottom, uh, both short-term interest rates and, and long-term interest rates, that um, I'm aware that the short-term trends can benefit them. But I think that the banks, specifically the regional banks, I don't really deal too much with the large, uh, large banks that have much more diversified uh, revenue streams, focusing mostly on the, uh, the smaller banks that are uh, mostly just spread plays. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm still cautious there, but I've pared back the short position to as small as I can because of the cyclical upturn. So once I see the indicator start to roll over again, and I would think that long-term interest rates would start to have downward pressure, I would increase that short position again, because I think this, the long-term trends are, uh, are, are very powerful against the banks, looking to, to things like Japan and Europe, uh, I think that our smaller banks will go the way of, of, of Japan and Europe. Larger banks, totally different story. Uh, energy is uh, is interesting as well. I, I don't like the energy sector. Uh, I prefer to just be exposed to the commodities at this point. The energy sector, uh, high debt, uh, the business model of the energy sector, specifically the frackers, is one that makes me cautious. Have to spend a lot of capital to, to build a well that just depletes, and then you have to build spend more capital on another well. And uh, that business model to me is, is tough because it's so reliant on constantly issuing new debt or new equity that uh, during these upturns, I prefer to just be exposed to the actual commodity price um, versus the energy sector. So I, I am still cautious on those two. I haven't added those as longs despite the upturn. I've added just mainly small caps in general on a broad basis instead of going down into the sector, la uh, sector layer. Yeah, I agree on the frackers. Uh, that's that's been an area I've been avoiding. Uh, for my energy plays, I'm mainly focusing on the ones that have kind of longer life assets and the the few out there that actually have pretty strong balance sheets. Uh, some Definitely. of the international, some of the international ones, for example. Uh, I guess speaking of international, so uh, we're both based in the U.S. and so we we have a somewhat U.S. centric view. Uh, I know in my work, I I also uh, carried out to focus in other sort of countries because uh, those can give us kind of uh, different secular trends, uh, which can be helpful uh, in, in a portfolio. Uh, so what what extent do you kind of uh, incorporate international markets into your framework? And do you have any allocations that are kind of, uh, you know, important for those at the moment? Sure. So my, my work internationally is, is much more broad. You've done some brilliant work on, on individual countries. I focus mainly on U.S. and then ex-U.S. Uh, or if I was to break it down a little smaller, mainly the, the developed markets. So the way that I play international, uh, mainly international equities, is, is you're right, I'm very U.S. centric. Um, when the dynamics that I found going back to the leading indicators is that when the leading indicators of U.S. growth are, are pointing higher, that generally means global growth is going to be heading higher. And especially because the manufacturing sector is so correlated globally that when there's a manufacturing upturn, there's a manufacturing upturn basically everywhere. And during these upturns in growth, uh, as counterintuitive as it may sound, better U.S. growth tends to lead to a weaker U.S. dollar. Um, so when we have a, an upturn, the dollar tends to get weaker. That gives a big boost to everything international. So I have increased my international exposure um, since basically the, uh, I started to see the upturn in the leading indicators around the summer of 2020. And that's when I started to increase the exposure to international equities on a broad basis. I One of the allocations I have is VXUS, so basically everything XUS. Um, and, and that's basically the way that I play um, as far as an allocation, the way I play international is when there's an upturn, I expect the dollar to, to lose value or the dollar to be softer. So I allocate more heavily than I would on my baseline approach to, to international equities more broadly. I don't uh, often get into country specifics um, as far as the allocation. I have research uh, broadly on, on you know, the, the developed markets, Japan, Europe as a whole, the United Kingdom. Maybe we can talk some, um, some of the long-term stuff about that. Uh, but as far as the allocation, I'm mainly U.S. or ex-U.S. And when there's a growth upturn, I shift more of my equity allocation to ex-U.S., which I have now. Yeah, it makes sense. And so I guess to dive into those uh, developed markets, uh, when we focus on Japan versus Europe for the United States, do you see any major differences between the three or do you see them all kind of on the same secular trends? Like, for example, one thing I often highlight is that 
one one big difference between those ex-US developed markets is that most of those have more structural current account surpluses. The United States is on the opposite side of that. Uh, do you see uh, you know that playing into your into your analysis at all? Or basically, if you were to kind of describe the the past that those three are on, obviously they have a lot of similarities. But do you, do you see them as kind of all on virtually identical path or somewhat divergent paths? Well, I, I don't think that they're all on on perfectly identi- uh, identical paths. But but my main framework is looking at is looking at the debt and the impact that it has on growth there and then the demographics. And those two factors, all the countries are headed down basically the same path. Like you pointed out, there's different um, current account situations. Uh, but as far as the US, when um, we can probably dive into this, uh, the situation with the US can, can be interesting because in the short term, the larger trade deficit can work to our advantage. And you know, part of my thesis is, is I do believe that the twin deficit will get worse in the United States. Uh, and, and that can be to our benefit in the short term because it can help us support uh, higher consumption and higher investment than we otherwise would be able to have without foreign support. Uh, it could lead to longer term problems down the road. We tend to see the twin deficits get really bad with, with emerging market countries. Uh, it's a unique situation, I think, with the United States. Um, so it doesn't play into my long term thesis as, as much as I think it, as it plays into your long term thesis. And this could be where we we slightly diverge on the long term trends. Um, the way that I would view the United States with with the, with the trade deficit is, you know, there's this view that if foreigners assent, uh, immediately stopped funding our deficits, that uh, interest rates would rise and the currency would depreciate, and that's possible. But the way that I would see it also is if the uh, trade deficit started to shrink or or foreigners started to buy less of our debt that would have to come out of one leg of our GDP equation as well. And the leg that I believe would fall in that scenario would be private investment. So I believe that either way, uh, a larger trade deficit or a smaller trade deficit are still gonna lead to weaker growth. It's gonna lead to weaker real growth, Uh, maybe not nominal growth, but it's gonna lead to weaker real growth in either scenario, because either we're going to be hollowing out our manufacturing sector if we have a larger trade deficit, or if we have a smaller trade deficit and we're not able to uh, uh, get external funding, we're going to collapse private domestic investment. And both of those have negative long-term consequences for real growth. And if our real growth continues to be uh, dragged lower, I think the inflation rate x um, some currency crisis will tend to follow the, the direction of real growth as well. Yeah. So, and if you focus on overall investment, uh, do you have a way to separate kind of what you think is going to be productive in the long term v- versus what might be malinvestment or m- what might be misallocated, uh, or do you kind of uh, you know put all those together when you know because it's obviously it's hard to determine in advance. Uh, right. But basically, uh, you know, I think one argument we can make is that the United States has, has had this because, as you point out, we're very unique in that sense. I mean, we have as a developed market, we have some of these characteristics that don't quite fit other emerging markets because we are to a large extent external funded as as the global reserve currency. Uh, and so do you see that as kind of playing a role? I know that, you know, from my work, it's, it's certainly kind of showing up in some of these more extreme politics or more kind of, uh, you know, populist uh, versus establishment situations, totally. because we have a higher degree of wealth concentration than most other developed countries. We've, we've you know, it's it, there's, to some extent, there's been a, a shift from, you know, a developed market uh, labor to emerging market labor, uh, but the United States has kind of accelerated that more than some of the others, and we because we've kind of undermined our manufacturing base a little bit more by prioritizing other areas. And it, so, of course, we've had the benefit of you know technology and healthcare and and areas like that. Uh, so, I guess getting back to the question, do you do you kind of um, when we focus on foreign investment, uh, do you have a way to kind of separate where that's going or, or what that might be benefiting? The way that I that I look at investment is I look at um, the velocity of money and I look at uh, the money multiplier. And as long as those two factors are continuing to move down, that would argue that the investment's unproductive. So in my view, you know, we can we can talk about velocity. I know, I think it's a little bit. Um, uh, hammering on velocity as a useless indicator, I think is getting to be an overused uh, point. I think there is value in the, in the, uh, in the metric. Um, if, if there's, there's two main ways I think that velocity increases. I think velocity will increase if there is an abundance of productive loans. People borrow money and it generates an income stream above the interest that they're paying on the loan. Over the long term, that'll raise the velocity of money. The second thing that'll raise the velocity of money is a complete loss of confidence in the currency that can cause the velocity to, to spike very quickly. 
So if we, it would be more coincident, but if we, uh, you know, excluding a loss of confidence in the U.S. dollar, which I don't think we're on the verge of in, in the next, you know, year, two years or something like that, uh, unless we see the velocity of money start to steadily increase, we can, uh, we can at least uh, assume that the, the uh, debt is being used unproductively. Um, if the money multiplier is declining, that means that the monetary base and the money supply are going up at the same rate, which means that most of the money supply is coming from quantitative easing, which tends to get recycled back into financial markets, which I would view as uh, unproductive because we're borrowing money and putting it into, um, you know, we're not putting it into the real economy. So it, it's not going to boost GDP is what I would say. So I would say following those two factors, money, uh, money multiplier and the velocity of money are the two best gauges we have to, to deem whether the, uh, the amount of new investment is productive or not. And given that those two metrics are still in a pretty serious downturn, we can assume that the, the debt that we've taken on, you know, partly because of the COVID situation and just malinvestment in general is still working against us. So I guess if we focus on uh, the debt picture, right, because that's something that we both incorporate a lot into our work. I know uh, Lacey Hunt incorporates that a lot into his work as well. Um, right. And so if you focus on the long-term debt picture, uh, how does that tie into deflation and inflation? Because uh, you know we we both know that that high levels of debt can be very deflationary, uh, and there's kind of things around the margin uh, that I think is where a lot of people debate. So if you were to uh, take a step back and explain why uh, debt is deflationary, uh, and and maybe how different types of debts uh, could could inter- interface differently with the economy. Sure. So I guess I'll give you my summary of all of the research on on debt that that, that I find useful. Um, there, there's remarkable consistencies across some of the research on debt. And uh, I note you know, four or five consistencies. First is that a little bit of debt is good. A little bit of debt can, can boost growth and can be pro-inflationary because it can uh, raise output above potential for a period of time. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that a lot of debt is bad for growth. The third thing that's remarkably consistent is the thresholds that are outlined in these various academic papers at at which debt starts to um, really have a negative impact on growth. And this is not just Reinhardt and Rogoff or, um, you know, there's, you know, dozens and dozens of studies that have been replicated across different statistical techniques that all seem to uh, settle on the range of about 80 to 90 percent of GDP. And that's not just at the government level, that's 80 to 90% of GDP across the household sector, the business sector, the government sector, the financial sector. Any one of those sectors tends to cross 80 to 90% of GDP, we tend to see a negative impact on growth. The other thing that's consistent, the last thing, is that once you surpass those thresholds, the decline in growth gets nonlinear. So it starts to look like a, like a U. A little bit of growth helps, then it starts to level off, and then it becomes like an upside down U. So those are the four consistencies. And if we map the U.S. long-term growth, I, I publish some of these charts on Twitter, look at like a 20-year annualized growth rate of, of real GDP, our growth rate's taking on that upside-down U-shape, very consistent with the research. So then you say, why is the debt uh, causing that downdraft in growth and the inflation rates following? Mainly it's because um, uh, private investment is what tends to suffer as debt levels get too high. And when private investment suffers, uh, the the infrastructure of the society tends to um, tends to collapse. You tend to have um, overcapacity in certain issues or unutilized resources, uh, things like too much you know uh, excess labor. And when you have uh, too much capacity in, in some areas, then that tends to bring the the inflation rate down. So the lack of investment tends to uh, suppress the real growth rate. And then the real growth rate tends to drag the inflation rate down because as, as growth gets lower, you end up having an abundance of resources that you're not using for that growth, and that tends to drag the inflation rate lower. So that's kind of how I square the debt picture with the growth and inflation picture, is that too much debt ends up uh, reducing private investment, which ends up reducing real growth, which ends up causing uh, an excess of capacity in certain areas of the economy. Uh, and if we focus on correlation and causation, uh, is there a way to separate, in your view, uh, you know, which which variable is more causal than the other? Uh, because you know, if you focus on, say, a failing business, one of the ways, you know, if if their growth is going down, one of the things they tend to do is take on more debt to try to make ends meet until they run into a problem. Uh, and right. so, given that multiple economies do have a demographics issue where they're becoming more top-heavy in terms of age, uh, you know, the, the the ratio of people, say, 
receiving benefits versus paying into benefits uh, makes makes things very challenging. And of course, that that over time translates into slower and slower uh, GDP growth. There's also a certain amount of saturation if you go from emerging market to a developed market and you start to meet a lot of the needs of the people. There's tend to be you know we we, we kind of growth ends up kind of being somewhat asymptotic in that sense. Um, so do you view that the debt is is uh, surely causal of that slower growth, or is that slowing growth then lead uh, policymakers or businesses uh, to begin kind of taking out more and more debt? That's a good point. I think that if the debt is productive in the sense that it generates an income stream above the interest, then I believe that um, it doesn't necessarily have to slow growth. And I think that we would be able to see that in the velocity of money. The second thing is we can stack up um, how much we're generating per dollar of debt and see that every a uh, dollar of debt now is generating less and less growth. Um, so, so I think that that's a valid point that you make. I think that there's no, uh, I don't think that we can say that all debt's bad and that uh, every use of debt is going to slow growth. Uh, I think that it's the it's the use of debt in the various ways. Um, I think there's a lot of available research that suggests that um, I'm not making a political point that transfer payments tend to be a very low productive. Uh, use of debt. And, and one of the things that we've generated the most amount of debt through is, is through transfer payments. So I think that transfer payments are causal in terms of the, the slowing of growth because it tends to reduce private investment. And you know the point that I would always circle back is that if we measure real GDP per capita, that's effectively the standard of living. It standardizes for population, standardizes for inflation. It's basically the, the productive capacity of the economy. So unless the, the, the litmus test, I would say, is if the debt is being used to raise the productive capacity of the economy, then all is fine. But if the debt's not being used specifically to raise the productive capacity of the economy, then all is not fine. And when we, when we uh, use a lot of transfer payments and um, you know, when we just look at the GDP equation itself, um, you know, higher levels of government spending um, will result in lower investment just on an accounting basis. So I think that that um, as long as the debt is being used productively, um, I know World War II is an example that you've done a lot of work on. Uh, that may be different than, than today because of how different the debt was used. So I think it can be uh, I think it can be both causal and um, uh, uh, you know, in certain senses, depending on the way that it's used. Yeah, you know, one thing is if you focus on the 1940s World War II period, uh, indust the industrial base roughly tripled. It went up something like yeah. two and a half times over the course of that decade. And then even after the war, it had some of a pullback, but it didn't pull back anywhere near to where it was because, of course, they were able to repurpose that for a lot of domestic uses. And so, yeah. you know, a lot of people focus on that the, the war took us out of the, the, you know, the depression or whatever. But it's really, I mean, all the all the you know the the things we did overseas was mostly destructive. It was more about kind of rebuilding the industrial base and things like that. Uh, and so, how do, how would you describe that as kind of conflicting with the you know the kind of the MMT approach, which is basically the argument that uh, if you if you say increase money supply a lot, if you increase deficits a lot, uh, but it comes along with increased productivity, that should keep inflation low. And that therefore they can get away with more of that kind of you know deficit spending or or monetary increase. Uh, whereas you're saying somewhat of the opposite that if they don't it, you know if 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 uh, industrial base stays low that actually has a deflationary impact. So how would you kind of clash those two views? Do you think as it relates to uh, you know whether or not higher productivity can tame inflation or if it can if it can you know lead to uh, you know deflation. Sure. So I, I would say that that with the MMT, w where it goes wrong is that um, there's no there's no mandate to increase the productive capacity of the economy. Most of the MMT is that we can do job guarantees, and if we say, okay, the government's going to run a huge deficit and it's going to pay people to to dig a hole and fill it back up, sure, they can run a big deficit and do that, and they can pay those people. But if it's not increasing the productive capacity of the economy, it's not increasing the standard of living at all, then the economy can't really advance. So I don't see how that would be inflationary. The second thing is that when the government spends money, um, it, it steals resources from the private sector, not in a balance sheet sense. We could always lever up and, and invest more money, but it steals resources from the private sector. It steals that labor. It steals those raw materials from the private sector that may be able to use those resources more productively. So, if we keep sending people money, uh, 
and sending people money with, with larger deficits. All we're going to do is divert resources towards consumption and government spending. And then again, in the GDP equation, GDP is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending. If, if G goes up and C goes up, then I has to come down. And if I comes down and we have less uh, jobs available here, uh, in, ter- in productive jobs here, then we have an abundance of labor. And if we have an abundance of labor, that drags down wages. And to me, that's the deflationary impact that MMT doesn't, uh, doesn't call for. And uh, the money supply would certainly go up quite rapidly. But in that scenario, the velocity of money wouldn't increase because it doesn't fulfill the criteria of, of an income generating uh, use. So, so that to me is a deflationary impact. So one thing I like to do is kind of uh, use uh, extreme examples to sometimes find kind of the boundary of of where a point can go, and then we can kind of bring it back to a moderate example. So if you look at, say, uh, one of the states that's had, say, you know, a major inflation, like, say, Venezuela, for example, one of their, you know, combination of bad governance, bad productivity, massive increase in the money supply. And so when you have that situation where the money supply goes up dramatically, but their overall productive capacity is, you know, either flatlined or gone down. Uh, and and basically the whole incentive structure is messed up. Uh, then you get a, a pretty high inflation base. So it's actually, uh, you know, if if you know hypothetically, if you were to say everybody has double as much money as they have now, let's bring it back to the United States. Everyone has twice as much money as they have, but we still have the same amount of homes out there, the same amount of cars are made, the same amount of copper and energy exists, the same amount of all these kind of different goods and services. How would that translate into? Uh, prices of those various uh, goods and services and and assets. Sure. So I would I would just like to pr- create some parameters here. Let's let's assume that the government sent everybody a check of a million dollars. I guess that's that's sort of what you're what you're saying here, right? Is that there's no doubt that that would raise nominal GDP growth. Absolutely. In the short term, everyone gets a check. It would raise nominal GDP growth. The question is, what happens in year two? Does everyone get another hundred thousand dollar check? If they do, they're going to need more than that to keep nominal GDP growth on an upward trajectory because they're going to need the same amount of money, plus they're going to need additional if they want to have growth. So if we're talking about these one-time payments, it can cause a short-term increase in nominal GDP. That's partly what we're seeing now. But as soon as those payments stop, GDP uh, goes on a downward trajectory right again. So if we're talking about one-time payments, then you're going to have a short-term boost in growth and a short-term boost in inflation until uh, people have a, uh, because the rate of change in their income would go down. They'd have, you know, let's say 20% income growth and there would be 20% income decline. So uh, they would have, uh, once the prices rose in year two, they would have less income against higher prices and that would drag the prices back down. If you sustained it and you did 100,000 this year, 105,000 next year, 120,000 in year three, that can keep the upward trajectory on prices. But again, it's only as good as the last payment. As soon as the payments stop, income growth would go right back down, and then you'd have less income against higher prices. And I believe that that would, in turn, bring the growth rate and the inflation rate back down. Unless, of course, we got to the part where uh, there'd be you know, crisis of currency or something like that. Exactly, um, of course. And, right. and so one thing I know we've seen this uh, past year is that, uh, you know, some people, when they receive the stimulus checks, they pay down some degree of debt, right? So yeah. we saw some credit card debt go down. I, I think it was something like $100 billion last I checked, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually, you know, reasonably small percentage of, of yeah. the amount of debt out there. Um, so if you were to have so the, those massive payments, let's say, you know, uh, you know, we have very large, say, fiscal deficits over the next several years, and people end up deleveraging some of their private debt. Does that have a somewhat inflationary bent, or would that, you know, that remains uh, deflationary in your model? Well, I, I think it, it depends, because if we go back to World War II, let's say, uh, one of the differences then was that uh, wages as a percentage of income reached almost 70%. So most of people's income was through wages. And we saw the savings rate rise pretty dramatically during that time. So people were saving out of income. Now we see the savings rate rise, or there was a brief spike, but it's savings out of government dissavings. It's not savings out of income. We see wages as a percentage of total income is actually less than half now. It's fallen to, I think, 49%. So all we're doing is we, in a, we're not really deleveraging the total debt pie. We're just shifting debt. We're basically passing the baton from the household sector to the government sector. So it would cause the household sector to, to, to fall a little bit, and then it would cause the government sector to go up. What that would do in, in, in my way of viewing things is it would make 
additional debt from the government sector, even less productive because you'd have more of a nonlinear benefit at the government level. And then it would make the household debt, new household debt more productive, but then we'd be delevering just to relever. So I don't, I don't see a way that that boosts the long run rate of growth or the long run rate of inflation. So long as we're just shifting debt from one sector of the economy to the other, because if we increasing debt on the government level, we're still going to be increasing government outlays as a percentage of GDP, which means some other part of GDP has to be going down as a percentage of the pie. And typically, government debt is geared towards facilitating consumption. So we always, what we're continuing to see is rising G and rising C, and that's going to put downward pressure on on I. Or to, to your thesis, if we want to sustain investment, we're just going to have to explode the trade deficit. So either way, I think if we just shift the debt to the government, the result would be lower I or higher trade uh, deficit to, to, to produce everything that we're trying to consume. And so maybe here we could focus on, say, the mechanics of kind of allocation decisions. So say you are a private capital allocator, uh, you are a venture fund or any sort of, uh, you know, a pool of money that's looking to uh, invest in businesses. Maybe it could be a bank making loans or maybe it could be, a, 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 you know, a, a more of a fund. If how so what to what extent does the government say, uh, you know, doing transfer payments or issuing their own debt? How would that influence the decision of those allocators on which projects that they want to allocate capital to? So how does that end up reducing their allocations? If you were uh, like a venture fund trying to, well, um, I don't know if it would in, impact their decision all that much because what the research shows, the research that I've read is that income decisions are, are mainly based on long run trajectory of income, not necessarily one-time payments. So um, I, I think that perhaps you'd allocate more towards goods consumption or, or goods producers, but we don't really produce a lot of goods here. So there's not really a whole lot of investment decisions to make. And this sort of plays into the whole malinvestment thesis is, is, is where do they invest? There's nothing to invest in over here. If you wanna invest in people that produce the things that we're gonna consume, it brings investment to over overseas. So I don't know if that changes the equation all that much for me in terms of where I would invest if the government's going to be doing a lot of transfer payments. Uh, you know, what we what we see is when the government's doing a lot of transfer payments, it's having a downward impact on on labor. People are working less. And what we're seeing is more consumption of technology at home and goods at home. So I guess if you were to allocate it, it would be towards technology producers and goods producers. Uh, but you know, the goods producers are are offshore. So um, I think that the allocation would, I guess, be bent towards uh, consumer-based technologies and, and fintech and I guess things like that would be would be the primary allocator. But um, I, I think that the one-time payments are different than a sustained income trajectory because I don't think people are going to make investments based on a one-time spike in consumption. Otherwise, we'll be stuck with overcapacity once that consumption dies down. It would have to be based on a long-run trajectory of income growth. Makes sense. And so for a lot of this, we focus on more on the manufacturing side. So I guess if we, uh, you know, do you do a lot of work on the real estate sector at all? Because I know that's another pretty significant contributor to the economy. It, it can impact commodities. Uh, it obviously impacts people's, uh, you know, household spending habits to some extent. Uh, so what are you finding uh, in the real estate uh, markets? Uh, and do you have any kind of uh, shorter term or longer term view on where those might be headed? Sure. So one thing I find interesting with the real estate market now is we've seen a pretty steady rise in long-term interest rates, yet partly because the Fed is buying so many mortgage-backed securities, mortgage rates actually continue to make new lows, despite higher long-term interest rates. Uh, so that's putting um, a lot of upward pressure on, on housing prices. And um, I think what we're seeing now in the real estate market is a huge demographic shift, obviously, uh, out of cities and to suburbs. That's having, as, as you mentioned, a huge reflationary benefit that's playing into this manufacturing upturn because everyone has to refurnish their, a, a new home. And there's a high velocity impact to that for a brief period of time. Uh, my view is that that's going to continue. I think that there's still leg behind that. I think the indicators of the housing market are still pointing higher. There's a lot of new residential construction still going on. But since we're basically just stealing uh, 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 real estate from the, the cities to the suburbs, I think that there will be a hangover effect once that whole demographic shift is complete. Um, so I think that that will eventually, once everyone buys a house and that pent up demand kind of is exhausted, we're going to have a hangover of all of those refurnished goods that are 
obviously all back ordered now. You can't get um, a dishwasher as your friend Luke Roman was trying to get. Um, so I think that um, we're going to have a hangover effect there. Uh, but as long as the Fed keeps keeps stepping on the mortgage-backed securities and keeps interest rates so low, it is going to facilitate more of a shift from renters to buyers. Um, but you know that's going to be uh, a problem if those mortgage rates ever start to go up because there's going to be several million new home buyers that find themselves immediately underwater because the price is so sensitive to changes in mortgage rates. Um, so I think that right now it's it's powering this or it's an added layer to this manufacturing upturn and that's still going to continue. But once that demand is is sort of saturated, then we're going to have a hangover effect because the uh, the the increase in the real estate market wasn't from a uh, newfound income or newfound jobs. It was mainly just a demographic shift. Yeah, along and at those lower interest rates. Uh, that's, and the lower interest rates. That's one of the things I've been watching too, because when you when you're kind of determining the appropriate valuation for for a company, whether it's a value stock or a growth stock, obviously a, a big impact is what discount rate you're going to use and what kind of target rate of return you're seeking. Uh, and you know, back for example in the dot com bubble, treasuries were yielding over six percent. You know, for for a big chunk right. of that, and and the you know I, I like to refer to the cyclically adjusted earnings yields, which is the inverse CAPE ratio. Uh, That's that kind my of, favorite as well. Yeah, smooths out, and so totally. uh, the the that was the lowest that stocks ever were compared to to say the ten year Treasury, and so that was a clear bubble. I think what makes things challenging here is that you know the the interest rates are so extraordinarily low that of course people have a tough time determining what do you pay for say a software company that might be growing at 10, 15, 20% a year. You're not sure how long that's going to go, but you're willing to pay a, a pretty high multiple for it uh, because interest rates are so low. So I guess in your right. model, if, if you see if you see kind of a, a secular stagnation yields, like you think that after the, whatever kind of bump we're having now, if we're going to return to lower and lower yields, uh, so your view would probably uh, infer that some of those really high growth stock valuations would probably remain elevated for the foreseeable future. Or do you see do you, do you see it differently than that? No, I, I do see it that way. And I think that the um, I, I do view um, equity valuations in a very similar way. I use the the CAPE ratio and and you, you square it up against interest rates. Um, I tend to caution when I square it up against interest rates because interest rates have an embedded growth assumption in them as well. So if interest rates are zero that can raise the discount rate, but that also is implying that there's really bad economic prospects out there as well. So what we see is that it raises the valuation for certain companies. It doesn't raise the valuation for other companies. So like in Europe, let's say, um, you know, anything that's that's a financial is uh, has, has a multiple of six or seven, uh, even though interest rates are negative. So if the company has no growth and it's a melting ice cube, then the lower value, uh, lower interest rate does not warrant a higher multiple. But to your point, if you have a company that's growing 20% or 30% legitimately, and you discount that at you know, zero or one, then the valuation can get kind of crazy. Now, where this gets into kind of a wonky regime is, you know, Amazon is one thing. They have legitimate revenue growth that's double digits. Fine. The question here is, now people are selling a story that we're going to have growth in the future. And there's nothing really there. It's just the prospect of growth. And investors are still bidding up those companies. And that's where we, we sort of, um, I think, get into some dangerous territory where uh, you can make the argument that if the company delivers on said growth, then the valuation should be X, Y, Z. But we have to see the companies deliver on said growth, which may be different than you know Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google, these are established companies, huge cash flows, legitimate cash flows, double digit growth. Uh, hard to say that they don't warrant the higher valuation with the lower discount rate. If you're in a sector like um, financials that your growth is just structurally impaired, we're not seeing uh, those companies get reflected in higher multiples at all. And then the question is, you know, a company that's just selling a story of growth, what do you do with that? Uh, I tend to just avoid those those companies altogether because I don't know uh, exactly what the rational way to value it those companies are and and the way to um, discount uh, how likely they are to deliver on those growth assumptions. You know, Tesla would be the would be the prime example of that. Is um, 
I think they actually have declining revenue growth uh, last time I checked, but the multiple doesn't matter because, you know, it's a story stock and it's, it's the growth of we're going to have, you know, a million taxis or the growth is going to be so explosive in the future that we warrant this huge valuation today based on the current rates. And, uh, that's that's a little bit out of my game because I don't know what the chances of them delivering on that are. Yeah, that's the bellwether I'm watching too because if you look at, say, the amount of cars they delivered uh, over, say, the 12 months, it's something like a 35% increase over the previous uh, 12 months, which is reasonably impressive given the pandemic. Uh, but then their stock price went up something like 900%. <laughs> <during that laughs> right. So it's right. like, it's like, exactly. you know, it clearly warranted some sort of increase, uh, most likely, but sure. then it's, you know, what, what, to what degree of increase did it warrant? And exactly. you know, especially because they're, you know, they're not say a, a software as a service company, they're a hardware focused company, they actually have expenditures. Right. And so they're, they're, borderline mm. break even depending on exactly right. how you want to measure profitability. Um, I guess one way, you know, we could take this discussion is to kind of focus on the end game here. So uh, I think that's, you know, uh, you know, people that have the more inflationary outlook or people that have more of a deflationary outlook, uh, that kind of converges towards what is the end game scenario for this? Because, you know, the deflationary outlook is one of those things where it keeps going in a certain direction until something breaks, either the currency breaks or civil unrest uh, rises because, right. uh, you know, people have, a, you know, their, their lifestyle uh, decreases. So uh, I guess from uh, you can take in what whatever direction you prefer, but I guess you know, folks on the economic aspect or some of the the tail uh, risk outcomes that could change some of this. Uh, how do you see this kind of long term grind towards deflation uh, unfolding after it hits kind of maybe certain breaking point? Especially because I think you point out that the deflation is actually accelerating. It's not just like a linear decline. It, it's kind of an exponential. Right. So how would you kind of see that right. resolving long term? Sure. So I, I think that's the critical point. I think that the uh, and it's really the real GDP per capita, which is the critical measure, and that's going to continue declining. And um, you know, we're seeing a lot of the the quote unquote end game play out as we see. You know, with with all of the the civil unrest, that's all totally related. And one of the points that I would make is that we've seen uh, real GDP per capita from let's say like the uh, the fifties to to the eighties was growing in the high twos uh, uh, to low threes on a really sustained basis. Uh, we've seen that drop to about 1.2, 1.3% on a long-term basis. But that's just an average of real GDP growth. As you mentioned, our wealth concentration is, is pretty extreme. So even though real GDP per capita is 1% on average, there could be, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but there could be 40, 50, 60% of the population that's already experiencing a decline in their standard of living. So that civil unrest is manifesting itself in a lot of different ways, including uh, a higher demand for transfer payments, which in my model is going to exacerbate the situation in terms of real GDP. I think it's going to make that worse. Um, where, where the end game gets kind of interesting for me is that, you know, uh, a lot of the inflation camp, and perhaps you can comment on this because I'm curious, is, is that we can solve some of this through through inflation. Where, where I tend to get a little tripped up with that is uh, if, if the target that we're looking at is increasing people's standard of living, to, uh, to, to quell some of the social unrest, we need to do something to raise real GDP per capita. Uh, debasing the currency or, or inflation doesn't seem like it's gonna achieve that goal, which may not, uh, may not result in any less uh, unrest than we're seeing. The second thing is, is I don't think we have as precise of a way to devalue the currency as we did when we were pegged to, to gold. Um, and I think that we, we lend ourselves to, to competitive devaluations from other developed countries. The third thing is that uh, devaluation may help our current debt load as it, as it stands today at the government level. But the, the largest component of our future liabilities are, are the entitlement programs. I think you know, today we have something like three or four trillion dollars of, of current entitlement programs. That's obviously going to balloon over the next five to 10 years. All of those entitlement programs, I believe there was a study that showed maybe maybe 19 or 20 of the programs have either explicit or implicit inflation links within them. Um, so they're all linked to inflation. So if we have you know five, six, seven percent inflation, it may reduce our current debt load, but it's not going to do a heck of a lot for our future debt load because it's all basically linked to inflation. So um, uh, one of the things that we're going to have to to grapple with it, it, it are these entitlement issues and. Um, you know, whether we remove the link to inflation, to me, that's some form of austerity because you're giving people less than what they were promised. Um, so I think that there's going to have to be some, uh, 
some form of austerity that comes down down the road. And um, I know people freak out when they hear the word austerity because it's never possible. But you know, when we think about inflation as a solution, uh, inflation is not going to solve the entitlement burden um, all that much. So I think that we we continue to grind towards weaker and weaker growth, and and the social unrest gets gets worse and worse until we we either grapple with the debt situation or uh, we have a big problem with the currency. Which which you know I think um, I think people can be surprised by how long countries can hold it together with really high levels of debt. Um, it mainly comes down to how how much they can uh, keep the population under control. Uh, but I, I think there's a scenario where the U.S. could, you know, be in a situation of 160, 170, 200 percent debt to GDP, and and the situation can still be, you know, quote unquote, under control in terms of you know society continues to operate with just with with weaker and weaker growth. So um, I think we continue to go down this path, and I don't think there's a threshold to how low real GDP per capita can go. I think that that up die down U relationship continues. Um, until we either uh, have some form of forced austerity or um, or some sort of currency crisis, which um, you know, I wrote a recent uh, note about that. You know, when you think about wealth preservation, um, you know, there's gold ETFs which are great for gaining exposure, but there's no substitute for physical gold. And you know, I wrote a note that you know having a percentage of your net worth in physical gold is is, is uh, um, I would think, you know, for me, it's a prudent strategy uh, to guard against that that type of scenario because I think that the situation is lower growth, lower inflation until it's not, and the until it's not scenario is is basically impossible to time, you know, also known as a Minsky moment. Um, so, so I think that that's how the end game plays out, or or the end game as far as my eye can see it right now. Yeah, there's been a similar argument for uh, farmland uh, because in some ways that has certain characteristics similar to gold in that sense. And uh, you know, I posted a chart uh, a few weeks ago showing that uh, if you look at uh, broad money supply per capita and you look at the price per acre of farmland, uh, they've, they've been highly correlated over something like a 50 year period. Uh, and I guess, so if we were to kind of uh, maybe uh, you know wrap this up by kind of separating different types of inflation, uh, I noticed when people, different, uh, people from different schools of thought debate about what you know what is inflation, whether or not it's accurately measured, uh, and they tend to be talking about different types of inflation. Uh, totally. And so, yeah, there are some schools of thought that you know they they basically view an in- increase in the money supply uh, as a form of inflation. Uh, they they generally would put some caveats on that. Different types, you know, how exactly you measure money supply, but basically, if the amount of currency units in a broad system is increasing, then it's inflationary. Uh, then, of course, we have a, a basket of goods that we can measure for inflation. And then, of course, it's going to be debates about what whether that basket of goods is appropriate, if, if the adjusters are appropriate, and people will debate right. about that. And a, a third type is potentially asset uh, price inflation, where, you know, going back to the Tesla example, you know, they, you know, if, say, a company produces the same amount of cars or, you know, 30% more cars, but then it's, you know, its share prices are are 5x or 10x higher, uh, basically, you're you know you're you're paying more money for the same kind of allocation of resources, essentially. And one thing I found in my research is that when you have that that first type of inflation, so just say you have a a massive increase in the broad money supply, that ends up somewhere. And of course, the the big question is where does it end up? And the, you know the right. short answer is that it, it kind of ends up in whatever happens to be scarce and in demand. And so if you have say over capacity of manufacturing, or you know you have no problems, no limitations there, it's not going to show up in in say commodities or or products, or because you know that that there's no scarcity. Whereas it will show right. up in in things like uh, prime real estate or gold or you know growth stocks or things like that. So. One of the things I'm looking at the long run is if we see money supply continue to increase at a pretty substantial rate, which you can get if you're running pretty big deficits, and then you know the, a lot of that's being purchased on the secondary market by by the, the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were to get that continued uh, uh, currency inflation, let's call it money money supply inflation, um, holding bonds in that environment seems somewhat challenging because even if you don't get that show, uh, that inflation showing up in the CPI. Uh, you are purchasing power as it relates to, say, prime real estate or uh, gold or, say, you know, really high quality equities could continue to diminish. So do you view Do you have any sort of separation there? How, how would you kind of co- incorporate that into your analysis? Sure. So I think that's a great point. I think that the uh, inflation as it relates to money supply 
uh, can be can be tricky because if I uh, let's say print a uh, trillion dollars of currency and then I light it on fire, that's not really inflationary. So um, uh, as far as the the basket of goods and services, why that's important is because that's what plays into into tips calculations and that's what plays into uh, the cost of living adjustments with a lot of the entitlements. So as much as people hate those metrics, we have to use those metrics because that's what is a huge factor in, in, our, in our future deficits and as well as in the fixed income market. Um, so I, I think we have to look at where, wh- where the money supply growth is coming from. And if we, um, if we look at it over the last like year, let's say, and we continue doing what we're doing, a lot of it is coming from quantitative easing in the secondary market, which is you know, causing a huge rise in deposits uh, at the banks. Um, you know, and if you take a non-bank that had a treasury and then you take the treasury away from them and give them cash uh, in the form of a deposit, they're, they're not going to invest that you know, going to the store and buying a sandwich. They're going to recycle that back into financial assets. So I think that the financial asset inflation can continue. Uh, and it can continue uh, as long as this is the way that we're deciding to increase the money supply. I don't think that adversely affects treasury investors um, who, are, who are targeting more of nominal GDP growth because nominal GDP growth won't increase really in that scenario. The second thing I would note is that that game can continue. And it's not that uh, the market will rise in perpetuity as long as QE is going on, because one of the things we have to realize is that at the end of the day, these are equities that need to be serviced. Their debt needs to be serviced with cash flow. So, you know, a company that um, may be in good standing with their debt can see their equity valuation rise quite dramatically. But if the underlying economy gets so weak because all the money supply is going back into financial assets, then at some point, some company somewhere is literally not going to be able to make payment on their on their bond. A commercial commercial real estate, for example, will literally not be able to make payment, and then that asset is literally in default. There's currently no you know no mechanism for the Fed to buy you know the defaulting assets um, at the moment. So it could be uh, you know akin to a scenario where you increase money supply and light it on fire in the sense that it could cause this really sharp rise in the equity market. But if the underlying economy gets so weak that a lot of these companies don't have the cash flow to support their bonds. They end up in bankruptcy. So we could see a large rise in the money supply, goes into the equity market, and that paper wealth kind of vanishes. That could also be a deflationary outcome. Um, so I think that um, holding bonds in, in this scenario only gets quite dangerous if nominal GDP uh, is, is rising on a sustained basis. And, and for that, I would use you know, some of my shorter term leading indicators to give me a heads up as to when that's happening, which, which it is now. So you know, I'm not terribly over. I'm not overweight long-term bonds at all. Actually, I'm actually underweight long-term bonds in this scenario because uh, the expectation that nominal GDP growth is going to increase. But the uh, the wild mania speculation and um, you know QE field uh, asset price inflation uh, to me doesn't work against the bond allocation all that much. Um, specifically, if you have a balanced portfolio that does have a fair amount of equities within it, as well as gold, as well as you know, aside from your uh, securities portfolio, a physical allocation to gold. Uh, in that scenario, I think that bonds still do play a critical role uh, in, in an overall portfolio. Yeah, and that's you know going back to that point about uh, company cash flows and the ability to pay uh, you know uh, debts. That's actually one of the concern- concerns I have is that we've seen such a speculative bubble, uh, especially in the past several months. Where just you know if you look at say uh, what retail investors are doing with call options and what we're seeing in you know the valuations of some of these stocks, you know I think that you know when this when the dust kind of settles on some of this, we see kind of a rate of change reduction in the amount of say money supply increases or fiscal stimulus. Uh, you know I think it's going to be one of those things where the the tide goes out and some of these things are kind of you know uh, basically I think that their prices have been up to uh, been bid up to a reasonable degree like let's say gold whereas I think some of these other things that actually have you know cash flows and then they're extraordinarily highly valued relative to those cash flows uh, I think they could have a, a pretty big kind of downdraft and I think that's that could potentially catch a lot of investors off guard yeah definitely and, and I know you've written about this one one point that I would uh, that I would make is that uh, when you price equities in gold, uh, the reason I like doing that is because it standardizes for inflation and it standardizes for changes in real interest rates. And real interest rates, to me, are the ultimate driver of, of you know potential equity valuations. And um, you know when you price, let's say, the Russell 2000 or, or even the S&P 500 in gold terms, it's gone 
nowhere since basically 1997. So to me, what that says is that equity prices have not been able to increase absent a decline in real interest rates. So when we look at the scenario from 1997 until now, real interest rates have basically declined from you know four or five percent to negative one. We've had a 600 basis point decline in uh, real interest rates, and you know when you price it in gold, you could assume that the rise in equities has been almost a hundred percent related to that decline. So you know this is you know uh, perhaps conversation for another time, a whole new can of worms. But at the zero bound, how do you uh, you know because holding interest rates at negative one percent in real terms isn't enough. It needs to be a continual decline. So how are we going to continue uh, lowering uh, the real interest rate in the economy if we don't have you know, total control over the CPI inflation, which is ultimately how we get the tips, uh, real interest rates? Um, you know, so pricing equities and gold has yielded basically no gains on a real basis after accounting for changes in real interest rates. So I think that's also going to be interesting. Is how, do we, how do we move forward in the, in the next downturn when our, our move in the past was basically just smash real interest rates. Um, h- how do we do that going forward? Uh, and that's gonna be a challenge, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I've been a big fan of that approach of, of pricing things in gold because you know people often look back at past analogs, like you know, they were comparing the the you know the early 2020 crash compared to the say the the Great Depression crash. And people forget that. I mean, that was the dollar was basically gold back then. And so you're basically you're you're pricing those equities declining in gold. And so they're not taking into account the fact that if we're about to have this massive fiscal stimulus, uh, if you're looking at those old charts that are, you know, basically equities going down in gold terms. Uh, that that's not necessarily going to correlate to what's happening uh, in the current time, and so that right. that's always been the challenge: is saying, sure, the economy is really bad, but here's why I'm I'm remaining overweight equities to some degree because uh, you know when we actually price things in dollars, it's going to be uh, somewhat of a different picture than if you price it in, in, in gold mm. terms. Um, I guess so. If, if we wrap things up here, uh, so going back to leading indicators, uh, I guess to help make things uh, you know as actionable as possible for people, what are some of the absolute key indicators you you'd be concerned with if you if you start to see them turn down? So you've mentioned that you still see them going up in the near term, or there's still sure. things. So what what are what is like if you had to say what are the top you know one two or three metrics that if those roll over. Uh, it basically calls you to position differently or, or lead you to watch other things. Sure. So I, I can give, I can give, I mean, I track many of these. Um, I can give, I guess, I guess three of them. Um, one would be, would be the dollar. So if we start to see a change in the dollar, the dollar can actually be an interesting leading indicator. You know, in, in 2018, in, uh, it was in April uh, when the dollar had a bottom and started to rise. And it wasn't until Q3 or even, you know, almost into Q4 of 2018, when the slowdown in growth became extremely obvious to most people. So I like to watch the Fed trade-weighted dollar indexes. Uh, they come out on a weekly basis. Um, I like the emerging market one most specifically because it ties into that manufacturing process. So I would say that if we start to see the dollar trend higher, the Fed trade-weighted dollar index for emerging markets trend higher, that could be one warning sign. I think a second thing would be uh, these non-exchange traded commodities. So, you know, uh, things like oil and and copper have these futures contracts that can get wildly speculated on. Uh, Commodity Research Bureau publishes baskets of, uh, you know, lesser traded commodities like copper scrap and hides and things like that. So if uh, those commodities are are exploding and there's not a whole lot of, you know, retail speculation in in those things, you can't really speculate on them. So I would say that um, if you see some of these lesser traded industrial commodities start to roll over, that would be a second indication that this, this, this pent up manufacturing rebound is winding down. And the third thing would be uh, the best survey measure is, in my opinion, is the ISM uh, report. I don't like the PMIs all that much. Uh, I track them, but the, uh, the new orders to inventory spread, I, uh, I actually accumulate that and convert it into a growth rate, um, also pointing straight higher. Uh, that's an interesting metric because if new orders are rising slower than inventory, that has a lead that companies are going to need to produce less because they just have uh, you know too much inventory relative to the new orders that are coming in. Right now, they have no inventory relative to too many uh, new orders, which gives you an idea that over the next couple of months, their production is going to really have to ramp up. That's more hours worked. That's more jobs, things like that. So I would say that if you see a combination of dollars start to strengthen, some of these lesser traded commodities start to roll over in growth rate terms, 
And, you know, you look at the ISM report, the new orders to inventory, that starts to roll back down. You'd have a pretty good idea that this uh, reflationary uh, momentum that we're seeing that's so concentrated in the manufacturing sector, that's going to start to uh, to roll over. And, and that would be my cue to, to pivot back towards the, uh, the disinflationary bias. Awesome. Yeah. It, so this was a great discussion and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Uh, so where can people find you uh, and, and where does your work, uh, you know, most, uh, you know, uh, available to people? Sure. So I think one of the best places is on Twitter. I mean, I'm super active on Twitter. You could also go to epbmacroresearch.com. Um, I have, uh, you could pop your email in there and you could be alerted to any of the new stuff that I put out. I also publish some work on uh, on Seeking Alpha as well. So I would say Twitter, epbmacroresearch.com and Seeking Alpha are probably the three best places. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Lynn. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.